Recording from our respective locations, I'm Public Affairs Director Matthew Huffman, and this is Momentum, a webcast produced by your coalition, connecting advocates across our state. So this is the month of October, and October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And uh, in the last couple of years uh, for October, we've really kind of talked about different aspects of Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So last year, we kind of talked about community outreach and how we do that. The year before that, we talked about um, the history of domestic violence shelters in Missouri and kind of processed through that, acknowledging the work that had happened before us. Um, but I wanted to take a bit of a different angle this year. So for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, the National Resource Center on Domestic Violence runs a project called the Domestic Violence Awareness Project. And the theme that they used this year for Domestic Violence Awareness Month is no survivor justice without racial justice. And the prompt that they did a lot of messaging around there is that this October and beyond, they're really calling on the domestic violence movement to center, celebrate, and really follow the leadership of Black survivors, leaders, advocates, and frontline workers. And I wanted to be able to really dig into that conversation in this month's episode of Momentum and really talk about what that looks like here in Missouri. So I'm very excited to have uh, uh, Havana Watkins and Janae Johnson with me on the episode this month. So Havana, Janae, welcome to Momentum. Hey, thanks for having us. Hi. Yes, thank you so much for having me. So I am going to jump right in and let the two of you give your bios and talk about your leadership experience and just introduce yourselves to our listeners. Um, so Havana, I will turn it over to you first. Awesome. Thank you. So hi, everyone. You've seen me a time or two or three. I think this is like my third momentum, but I am the partnership development coordinator at MLCADSV, and I've been here um, almost a year now. Um, prior to coming here, I worked uh, for Life Source Consultants in Ferguson, right in St. Louis, Missouri, uh, which is a non-residential domestic and sexual violence center. And I worked there in two capacities, one as a program director and also as an executive, direct, executive director there. Um, also, I am a doula in the St. Louis area, and I just love that work of you know, being able to make my own schedule and help moms and survivors and just meet those needs that um, a lot of them need when it comes to health equity. Um, I also have been a part of the LEAP cohort. I was part of co cohort three um, a few years ago, right before my daughter was born. And it was a very unique leadership opportunity that came across between Cal Casa, which is now known as Valorous and Women of Color Network. And it was like an 18 month program. And I learned so much from that, so much about the field and was able to build leadership skills along with really good relationships outside of the state of Missouri. So throughout the United States, I have like a support system. And I've actually just been asked to come back and sit on a panel about my experience with working with them and actually build up some more leadership and mentoring um, abilities with others, which I really value because like I got something and I always want to give something back to others because I felt it was very valuable. And I'm also doing a, a blog and podcast with um, Valores. I keep wanting to say Cal Casa. So I've had a few opportunities um, to learn, but also now I'm actually on the other side where I can actually like pour into others because it was really valuable for myself. Thanks, Ivana. Mm -hmm. Janae, I'm going to turn it over to you now. Great. Yes, I'm so happy to be here. I'm Janae Johnson. I'm the Director of Redevelopment Opportunities for Women at Family Forward. Um, we are a domestic violence uh, program within a larger um, children's nonprofit agency. And we focus on providing services to um, survivors of domestic violence who are particularly on the margins. So those who have experienced poverty or homelessness um, immigrants and refugees, and th that is our, those experiencing poverty and immigrants and refugees, those are the, that, those are the primary groups that we focus on. Sorry. <laughs> um, so. No we, big deal. We love okay. seeing pets make cameos in this. <laughs> they, they are sleeping all day. And then as soon as the, I'm on a Zoom, they're like, oh, I need, I need you to pay attention to me. So, um, but yeah, so we, at, at Roe, 
we do a lot of work around economic empowerment. So being able to help survivors of domestic violence rebuild after an abusive relationship, helping women in poverty be able to understand how money works and how they can save for the future or just really have a financial stability that, that they may not have had before. Um, we work with immigrant and refugee women who have also survived domestic violence. And um, we provide the services in the language of origin. So we have services, we have advocates who provide services in um, English, of course, but then also Spanish, Bosnian and Vietnamese. And um, hopefully soon we will have someone who can speak uh, Farsi Dari. So we, it's really important for us to be able to make sure that our services are very accessible because um, especially since we're working with people who may not have traditionally had access to these types of resources. So I've been at Roe um, for, I just had my five-year anniversary about a month or two ago. Congrats. I started, yeah, I was, I'm very excited. And I, I started as an advocate and then um, went into a supervisory role and then and now program director. So I've, I've been in all the positions <laughs> um, at Roe. Um, other than therapist, I, I've never been in that position, but we do offer trauma therapy too. Um, but so before I worked at Roe, I didn't really know anything about economic empowerment or economic advocacy. Um, and so I really have learned so, so much over the past five years about um, how survivors can access economic resources and what are the barriers, not just the systemic barriers and the structural barriers, but also the barriers of trauma, the, the mental and emotional barriers to being able to access those financial resources. And so my, my goal um, over the next, and over the past like year or so, and over the next couple of years is really to get training out there for advocates to be able to understand how to provide economic advocacy in a trauma-informed way. I have had experience working as um, an attorney and working in a residential capacity and also as just as a community-based advocate. So I've been in a lot of different positions in ways that I, knowing in, in ways that I can assist survivors. Um, and to me, this role has been the most impactful because it really is helping people be able to have stability for the future and that prevents people from going back into abusive relationships so it can really help I, I truly believe that economic empowerment is a, a huge key to breaking the cycle of violence and so my goal is to be able to train other advocates we um, are providing a we, we've done trainings about REAP which is our curriculum realizing your economic action plan um, and that's, we have done trainings on, on our curriculum throughout the state, throughout the country, throughout the world, honestly, um, uh, where we talk about, you know, money and power. That's a big part of our curriculum is to be able to understand that there are certain groups of people who haven't had access to these resources to be able to take away some shame and blame that's always surrounding, you know, someone's economic situation. And so... Um, and then helping people understand, you know, just really basics, you know, how to create a budget, how to understand their credit report and their credit file and how to invest and save money for the future. And some even very basic, like how to open a bank account. And we have, we have many people who come to us without ever having had one before. So um, the goal is to be able to train other people so that we can spread this, you know, Row is a small but mighty program, but we can't do it for all the survivors in the area. So being able to train other people is really important. We received funding from the Allstate Foundation who also has their um, economic empowerment curriculum. We received funding from them to create a, this a sort of like next level, like 201, 301 type level of economic advocacy to be able to help to, to explain how trauma and oppression can be barriers to economic stability, um, especially so, especially for women of color um, and women who've experienced poverty, immigrant, refugee women. 
uh, all the barriers on top of the histories of domestic violence and other traumas that they've experienced. And my goal is to help people understand oppression as a trauma that has altered your brain and it has, has altered sometimes your ability to receive information. And so we have to really figure out ways that we can manage that in our program because that's those are probably the biggest barriers we come up against for economic stability. So that's, that's the goal for the future. Um, I am involved in lots of stuff in the community. Advocates of color in the St. Louis area is really important to me. Being able to have fellowship and mentorship with other advocates in the area um, who experience the same things that I do is just is really super important to me. And um, being able to have that connection with other advocates, it really helps me be sustainable in the work. It's really a form of self-care to me. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's my, my background a little bit. Um, I could go on and on and on forever about economic advocacy. So I'll just stop. <laughs> well, Janae, I really appreciate that background, not just about yourself and your passions, but also about Roe and the work that you all do, not only for the St. Louis region, but just like you said, the work that you all are able to do around the state, nationally, around the world, really focusing in on economic empowerment. Um, and something that I, I heard you say that I just want to lift up really quickly is um, that you all are treating oppression as a trauma. And I think that's such a really important thing for us to think about in our work. Um, and that trauma and oppression are absolutely a barrier to economic stability. And we know that economic stability is a protective factor against violence. But if we aren't looking at these other intersecting identities of how oppression and trauma can come up for an individual, then we really aren't providing that comprehensive and, and really kind of whole person perspective on it. So I appreciate you lifting that up. Yeah, yeah, that, that has been really important. And I think, not that it wasn't noticeable to me before, but especially with COVID-19 and being able and seeing how there, there's so many unbelievable like health disparities and economic disparities. I mean, the, the people who have been primarily losing jobs have been, you know, people of color, women of color, people in poverty. And so that has really brought that to the forefront of my mind. And so I think, you know, that it's just further pushed, I think what we, we already sort of knew, but it, it has highlighted it in such a different way. So, yeah. I appreciate that too, Janae, because so many times like other people don't understand what vicarious trauma is. Like we're showing up, but you don't know what we're going on at, at home. Like we weren't able to get off because we didn't have enough time to get off and we didn't want to be penalized. Now our child has missed the doctor's appointment or we were late. And then when you're late, they're like, oh, you can't be seen. Instead of saying it, how about you figure out why <laughs> somebody was late opposed to being like, nope, try again next time. And then after that, if you miss too many or late too many times, then they're unable to even see that doctor again. And then they have to go back to the drawing board. And it's like, hello, what, where are the protective factors at for everybody involved? You kind of got to look at those things. Sorry, my health equity ears. No, I, yep. <laughs> no I, I agree with you. It's, I mean, and it's the same thing that I, exactly what you're saying. And, and that's how we are applying it to economic empowerment. Mm -hmm. When someone comes in and they haven't been able to keep a budget or they've completely blown their budget, you know, instead of saying, all right, well, let's just start over and start from the beginning. We say, okay, well, before we start over, let's figure out what was going on in your life, what was happening over the past couple of weeks, couple of months that may have triggered some emotions in you that made you be spending emotionally or something like that. And that's, I think that's the part that we've we've left behind and the part that, but we're catching up to that and because we're realizing, you know, what, what barriers there truly are to really having that long-term economic stability. You know, there was something else that you just said, Janae, that, that really kind of made me think, and it was whenever you're working with an individual and thinking about, you know, maybe 
what would have caused you to do spending in this particular way and how can we plan for that? Um, that there's such a really important aspect of the work that you all are doing at Row of taking the stigma away of talking about money in general. And I think that there's such a really big stigma still attached to talking about money. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially when we look at that intersection of some of the most vulnerable Missourians are people who have been the most affected by the pandemic. Right. And it has caused them even further uh, to struggle economically. So I think that's such a really important piece of not, not kind of reinforcing any sort of blame or stigma around why somebody would spend money the way they are, yes. but really helping to figure out, yeah, what, what has happened that would make you want to spend money this way or spend money this way and to have open and honest conversations about that is so important. Yeah, I mean, that's, and I'm so glad you said that because that's such a huge part of this new training that I'm doing when we're talking about, you know, understanding oppression as a trauma and how that relates to economic stability. A big part of that is recognizing that <clears throat> we're asking people to talk about things that it, are taboo you know, in society, you know, we say, you know, we don't talk about politics or religion or money. And so we're asking people to, who, who would probably have all the societal stuff in their head, a lot of shame around how they're spending and, and we're asking them to divulge that to us. And they're really putting a lot of trust into us. And so we have to be able to be the ones who understand that, you know, we can't be assigning our values or societal values to the way that people are spending because that doesn't create long-term financial stability. What really does is to be able to understand what is that person's value, what's important to them, and how does that fit with what their spending plan and their spending goals are mm -hmm. instead of, you know, having that additional layer of, well, I don't even want to tell you what I spent money on because I'm embarrassed or I'm ashamed or whatever. So if we can break down that barrier and say, you know, this is really about you and what you want and need. That's how people can actually have that consistent change in their lives. Completely agree. I really appreciate you taking some time to to lift that up, the work that you all are doing and the really important uh, and unique aspects of it too. I'm gonna I'm gonna shift gears a little bit um, and uh, and ask y'all to kind of talk about yourselves again um, because uh, I uh, I also really want us to to talk about the importance of women of color being in leadership positions and uh, highlighting that and celebrating that. And so thinking a lot about the values that we bring into this work, I'm curious to hear from the both of you, what particular leadership styles or leadership characteristics do you really consider as your own values and, and how do you bring those into the work? So this time, um, Janae, I'm gonna start with you and then we'll turn it over to Havana. <laughs> So um, my leadership styles are ever changing. I still I still see myself as a as a newer you know leader, and so I'm still learning and adapting. And also, I think it's really important for me to have leadership styles that are adaptable to the staff that I'm working with. So you know where some person might prefer a supervisor who's more you know reviewing their work and seeing what they're doing. Other people prefer, you know, a lot more hands-off. Other people need that more supportive guidance. So it depends, I try to make it person-centered, honestly. I, I, I kind of see myself as, you know, since I moved out of being, doing a lot of direct service, I see myself as an advocate for my staff in a lot of ways. So um, I think when we're thinking about those like common, leadership types, I, I, I see myself as somebody who has a very democratic leadership style. I like to get a lot of input from people because I know, because I hired people because I know that they're, they have amazing ideas and they have amazing goals and they, they have so many good I, 
ideas about serving survivors of domestic violence. And so I wanna hear from them. I wanna know what their ideas are. So as much as I can getting their input, but I think my, my primary style is very um, protective. I'm, I'm, I'm a very protective supervisor. I'm, I'm really big on self-care. I push it and push it and push it to the point where my staff's like, all right, Janae, like I'm tired of hearing about it. But I know, but such an important thing to me is being able to bring in new advocates and keep advocates who are passionate about the work. And so that self-care piece is so incredibly important, especially for advocates of color, advocates who are also themselves survivors of domestic violence, advocates who have experienced a lot of the things that our participants have experienced. And so I, I believe if, if you have a passion for this work, that's a huge piece. But also if you don't take care of yourself, you won't have sustainability. You won't be able to stay in the work. So that's why I'm like, I am self-care. I talk about it probably every meeting, every day, every supervision. I'm always like, what did you do for self-care this week? What are you doing? And so um, I don't even know why I went on that tangent. Oh yes, because I am a very um, protective supervisor. So I, I wanna make sure that they have what they need because I think when it, whenever my staff, when they have what they need, that's the best way that they can serve survivors. And so um, really being a servant to that and making sure that we have a staff that is healthy and well, so that we can make sure that those we serve are healthy and well too. Uh, I love that. I don't think you can ever talk enough about self-care um Thank especially you. Tell, my, tell tell everybody a row that I, I yes really... <laughs> <laughs> well especially because you know I completely agree with you the work that we do is really difficult and if we aren't also taking care of ourselves we can't best serve survivors um and uh, I don't think we can talk enough about that because I even see, you know, talking about self-care and wellness as still kind of taboo, specifically in nonprofit and advocacy work. Um, there's a little bit of a martyr complex that I think is still so pervasive. So I'm really glad that that's a style that you always carry and bring with you. Yes, absolutely. And I, I completely agree. I think we, in a lot of ways, we praise that, like overworking, we praise, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times people will tell me, you know, oh, Janae, like you're involved in this, 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 and this, and this, you know, like, that's amazing. Like you care so much. And I'm just like, like getting constantly praised for doing way too much, <laughs> but it re but that reinforces like, you know, I've got to keep doing this. It's so important. But I think what we really should praise is, oh, Janae took two weeks vacation. That's something to praise. So I, that's what I try to praise with my staff too, is that, you know, making sure that whenever they actually do that self-care that it's acknowledged because it is really important and it's hard to do. So whenever you do it, it should be celebrated. Absolutely. Havana, gonna throw this question over to you now. Sure, well, I absolutely love that, Janae. So I'm all on this self-care wellness journey myself. Um, and when I was working, specifically um, in advocacy and at a member program, that was something that I always wanted to do, like implement those intentional times and days in that space for you to be able to do self-care and wellness because, you know, so many times we, we have that vicarious trauma again, right? But we still got to show up, but we also need time to take care of ourselves. And I find myself feeling more like I lean in that servant leadership style because like I care so much about people. Um, and so it's like, kind of like you said, Janae, like an advocate for who's working on my team, but also wanted to advocate for the type of work that we're doing, right? Like, how are you not just showing up and being like someone's superior or someone's peer? Like, how are you really doing? I'm not talking about work, but how are you doing? Like, and you'd be surprised the looks you get because people aren't always invested in their employees or their coworkers. They're just like ready about work. What are you getting done? Like, and if there's something that, is needed, maybe they need that extra 20, 30 minutes time to talk about something that's bothering them or they're going on, go, have going on at work. And you can encourage them to do some self-care and some self-reflection and some 
personal whatever space that they may need. And um, I just think that that's really important. And I'm always wanting everyone to be better, right? Like, I don't think that anybody should be working with me or on a team that's going to be in the same position for the next X amount of years. Like, okay, so what else do you want to do? What's your next goal? Like, what can I do to help you with your next goal? And I'm a connector. So I'm like, oh, you want to do that? I know somebody who might not like, so I was like, let me connect you and put you in conversation with somebody that can help you meet, meet your next goal. I don't expect for you just to consistently be in this same space because we want to grow and we need to grow. So I kind of feel like I'm in there like servant leadership, like I'm there and I'm not going to ask you to do something that I haven't done because I'm going to do it too, because I have worked my way up from the bottom. But I also want you to know that I'm there for you too. So not just you as like, a peer, as an employee, as a colleague, but like, what is it that you need? And within whatever space that folks want to share, because everybody may not feel comfortable sharing and that's okay too, but just letting people know like, hey, I'm there is I think really, really important when it comes to like work morale and any kind of morale, just so you can get to know people on a more personal basis. And it's not just so centered around your nine to five or seven to three. So that's kind of what I have. I, I want to echo that too, Havana. I think one thing that you said that really, like, I, I really connected with was we need, we have to view everybody as not just their roles, but them as human beings. Yeah. And I think we get so caught up in like, you know, you're an advocate and we forget that, you know, they're, they're not always an advocate that you, you can't always be in that role. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are going to be times when, the, you know, we just have to view people as the human beings that they are. And I think that's whenever I'm encouraging self-care with everyone that I work with, I always say it as, I'm not saying this because, you know, this is just something we talk about. I'm saying it because I genuinely care about you as a person mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that you're well, and I know how hard this work is. And so, you know, really seeing, saying it as, I'm not talking about you as the advocate. I'm talking about you as the person, like you, you need to take care. And so I think that's, that's a shift in my mind, at least, because mm -hmm. we're often so focused on, you know, the roles that we fill and not us as individuals. Right. I agree. So I want to go a little deeper into that. And as a follow-up question, Thinking about how I heard both of you say you're, you are servant leaders, you're very interested in helping people get to where they want to be and giving back. And uh, so I'm curious, who were the folks that invested deeply in you and really helped you get to where you are? Havana, I'll start with you this time. <laughs> okay. I feel like it's been like a trifecta of many people, right? Like, Getting into this field was not easy. As we all know, it can specifically in our St. Louis area can be kind of hard to get through those walls and barriers. Um, so initially my mentor Marissa actually introduced me to Dr. Johnson who gave me a chance and who kind of helped and molded me. And then I started seeking, once I got into the field, seeking out the wisdom of others. And um, it just kind of built from there. And Janae has poured into me. I just talked to her maybe last week about some stuff. Like, it's just crazy how like, you know, things come full circle. And now here we are. And um, there's just been like, Christina Holmes was amazing. She's always been like the big sister of the movement, right? Like anytime Christina talks, you're going to listen. You're going to hear what she has to say. And you're going to listen to her advice. And you're going to take it really well. And I also gained a lot of leaders being an elite cohort, right? Like, so I have a, an amazing mentor that I talk to literally every Friday. It's just like, she's like my guy, mom, I drop the kids off and we talk on the way back and just like checking in. And it's not just like, how are you doing professionally? How are you doing? And that's what I, where I really got it from, like valuing you and, and what you're doing and not just like, quote unquote, being in your business, but just really wanting to check in and see how you're doing because we get in a hustle and bustle of doing things and forget to like, take a deep breath and check on ourselves. So I've had a lot like kind of through throughout time and I keep looking for more because I always want to learn more like I'm forever evolving. So I just really value the relationships and um, Janae probably does not even know that I look at her as a mentor because um, <laughs> we always like talk about things but like 
it's so much value in those relationships that you gain things from it that you really didn't know that you were going to gain. So I really love, um, I love all of, all of my people who have looked out for me and poured into me. I agree with you, Havana. I think it's been, there've been so many people who have been so warm and open and willing to answer my questions and willing to hear me when I'm excited or frustrated or annoyed or, or whatever the case may be. And I think having, having Havana, having Christina, having, it's weird because she works like under me now, but, my, but Rachel Evans, who's a clinical supervisor in my program, having all those advocates of color and just being able to gather and be able to say like, these are the things that I'm experiencing that are wonderful. These are the things that are, I'm experiencing that are not wonderful. And being able to just have support, ha have that, that fellowship of being able to talk to, talk to people who ha are having similar experiences. I think I've been really fortunate because I, I lived in Boston before. That's where I went to school. Um, and I moved back in 2016 and I, I got the job at Roe. And when I came into the field here, I felt sort of like, I was like, oh my God, like everyone knows each other and I don't know anybody, but so many people welcomed me into the movement. I think that, that all of the, you know, the partner agencies and the leadership at, in the St. Louis Ending Domestic Violence Network, I think I've been able to have so many good connections. I was previously the, um, the JOT, Joint Orientation, we, that's a training that we have in the St. Louis area for new advocates. I was previously the coordinator and I met so many people that way. Um, you know, and I met, I met a lot of people that still like help me and I can reach out to and just be like, Hey, like, can you, like, can you help me with this? Or can you talk to me about this? And, um, and my, my old supervisor, Angela, she really, she really pushed me to get involved into a lot of things. And so she was always very encouraging of me being involved in different community spaces. And I think that has, is really what has led to being able to have that support in the community whenever you need it. Like knowing if I, 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 can, I can go to somebody if I really need that support. So, and that's been really important to me, but I, I would say for sure, um, especially having other advocates of color to lean on that is so that that has been just phenomenal and and everyone has always been so supportive and um always there when you need to celebrate or to vent regardless so yeah Janae you you really started to touch on it just now and I want to tie it back and lift up something that Havana said but really placing value on these relationships. Um, and before I ask the question, I'm going to give the caveat that I'm asking this as a, as a cisgender white dude, right? Um, but thinking about that need to have a safe and supportive space for advocates of color to connect and celebrate each other and support each other and really investing deeply in those relationships why is that so important? Why is it so vital to have those spaces specifically for advocates of color? The work is hard. The work is just, it's really, really hard. And I think we're, we're not just dealing with, I'm a domestic violence advocate, or I'm a program supervisor, or manager, or leader, or whatever. I am also coming to this job with my own experiences of oppression and trauma and just systemic challenges that I've experienced in my life. I never come into any space not being a black woman. I, whatever space I enter, that's what I am. And so when I come into this job as an advocate, I'm also holding on to, I'm also a black woman. I have also had experiences of poverty and homelessness. And so I, 
there are moments where things are very triggering, very upsetting, very, you know, very hard to deal with. And having other advocates of color who are also dealing with those, you know, those systemic challenges of, you know, nobody in my program leadership is a, is a woman of color. I don't have a mentor, that kind of thing. We can lean on each other for those types of things because there aren't, there aren't enough women of color in leadership. And so it's hard to be able to have a mentor whenever there are difficult situations, challenging conversations that you have to have about how we serve survivors, making sure that our services are inclusive and you feeling responsible for that and also having that as a challenge of your own, right? And so I think a lot of times as advocates of color, as women of color, we are dealing with a lot of the same things that the women we serve are dealing with, the people we serve are dealing with. And so it's so vital to have someone that you can go to and say, you know, this thing happened and I don't know that anyone would understand it other than you. Mm -hmm. or this thing happened and I don't know if I'm I'm crazy like I, I I just need to hear it from someone else I need to hear your perspective or just I need you to encourage me I I'm I'm feeling like like I can't do this I'm having that feeling of imposter syndrome and I need to hear it from someone who's been through it too you know and to let me to encourage me in knowing like you know there are other people out here to support me. I'm not in this alone. I can do this. So it's it's just, it's incredibly vital. I think that's a big reason for why we often have advocates of color turnover in our jobs because there just aren't enough supports in place for them to be able to, you know, have those really difficult conversations that they, they feel like my supervisor might really not get it or my, my supervisor might be offended if I say it, you know? And so having a space where they can go and know everything is safe here and I can get the support that I need, it's, it's crucial. Yeah, I like to echo all of that. It's very vital because like, we're always having to show up, like always showing up. And then you're always having to fight. Like we're back in like, that's the lifestyle that we live, right? Of always coming in defensive because you are young, you are a woman of color, or you have something else going on. Maybe you identify as LGBTQ. So now that's something else. And it's it's a lot, it's heavy. So now you want me to also turn on being somebody's supervisor, being someone's colleague, and then turn on being an advocate. And as Janae mentioned, like it's, it can be re-triggering, just the notion of something. And you can't always go to those that are you're working with. Number one, it's uncomfortable. Number two, it's not really relatable. Like as much as you would want to empathize and understand, you can never understand how it is to be like a person of color. So being able to have that space, that collective moment of at least I know once a month I can get together with other advocates that understand like being an advocate, but they're also a person of color. So you're showing up with all these different identities and you have someone that you can lean on, you can cry with, you can laugh with, you can figure out how to navigate so that when when and if a, a situation arises and you have to approach it, how are you going to approach it so that you don't come off as the angry Black woman, you know, because we're always deemed as the angry Black woman. Well, now you've pissed me off, so I am angry and I am Black, <laughs> <laughs> so this is how I'm showing up. But we also need our jobs, right? So you want to be your authentic self. However, how can you do that in such a way that you can get your point across and not be be deemed as that stereotypical person that we're always deemed as, as being the person of color. So having the, those spaces and those mentors and those peer mentors to like help you navigate what to do and say is very valuable. And then when you think about some of the other things that may be going on, like social unrest, that's not always a, a easy conversation to have. And it makes people very uncomfortable. But again, unless you identify as one of those marginalized community, your empathy is, isn't the same. So you need that space and you need to be held with others that you can just cry. You can vent about how you're feeling about certain, certain things. And then you can feel better to still go on, but constantly bottling that up. is not healthy. Um, constantly living fearful of if I say something or if I take off, 
no one's going to understand. There's going to be some issues around that. And like, you know, it's, it's, it's always something. So being able to have that space where even if you can't get together, you got somebody you can text, you can email, you can say something to that really, really understands it. Because even in this work, it's like a, as an advocate and not identifying as a person of color, like our partners don't always understand what we're talking about, <laughs> what we're going through. So it's nice to be able to have others that are exactly relatable to what it is that you're going through and help you navigate. And if you need to cry, you can cry. And it's unjudgmental. And um, I just think it's really important to, to make space so advocates of color can have that space to have this moment. It's, it's usually just once a month. So, you know, I think it's, it's really valuable to have something to look forward to, to like, I just need to make it to this Tuesday and then I'm going to be good. And then it's, you kind of got to revitalize, right? Your, your cup is filled back up. You can go back in and figure out a way to be strategic on whatever else it is that you need to do to keep going. So thinking uh, about you both as being very people-centered leaders and really thinking deeply about how you have have been invested in by others uh, who have mentored you and also how you invest deeply in other folks as well. I'm kind of curious to hear what advice would you give for young advocates of color who are getting into this work to end gender-based violence? Let's start this time. Yeah, I was gonna let this one be kind of organic. So Havana, let's start with you then. <laughs> um, I, I think it's really valuable in finding like your person or your people, like finding your village and you, you, you've got to find like that support system. And it's not always within your organization. I actually think it's pretty good to go outside of your organization to find like your village, your advocates of color, your people of color gathering. If there's not anything specific where you're at, like find it and, and make it because without the support of others, it's going to be really, really hard because it's, the work is hard. It's difficult to do so much, but you definitely need support. And it's a specific type of support when it talks about ending gender-based violence. Like it's, it's very unique. It's a very unique field and you need to, to be mentored and be surrounded by, by others that have been through it, um, that are still in it and going through it and can kind of help you navigate that. Because I don't think that it's, it's not meant to walk this journey alone and you, you get further with with support. So that's one of my biggest things is like find others that can help you and mentor you and you can lean on like find your village and also find other opportunities to build on that outside of like your little circle. Like I really love like the leap leadership because now I have others I can throw something in the Facebook chat and folks from Alaska to Guam will answer like here's what I have this is what I've done and it's, it's really nice to kind of get a different perspective because people do things differently than in the Missouri and St. Louis area too so it's like oh we're ahead of the game or we behind the game <laughs> one of the two so it's really nice to kind of hear what other folks are doing again some other input as well but just finding those opportunities for leadership finding those opportunities for connectedness and uh, collaborating with others that are in the field. I definitely agree with that. I think the big thing I was thinking was get involved in, in, in the community. Find things that beyond just your job mm -hmm. that really bring you joy and really spark that fire. Because, you know, if you're entering into the field of, of intimate partner violence, you are entering it because you have, you have a passion for the work. You want to do good work for people. And so whenever you're doing that, it's important for you to find things beyond just the day-to-day -day things in your job to stimulate your, you know, your intellect, to stimulate your curiosity. So finding different trainings, finding different committees and things to be involved in. It's not just, you know, work all day, every day. I think that's really super important. And I also want to echo what Havana said about, you know, just finding people, finding a finding people that you know you can rely on, people that you know you can turn to, to, like I said before, to either celebrate or to vent one of those things. Um, ha having, whenever you're doing work where, there, where there's a lot of, you know, compassion fatigue, it also leads to this feeling of, I think, isolation in a lot of ways. It feels like, you know, my friends don't understand how difficult this job is. My family doesn't understand how difficult this job is. Well, 
guess what? There are somebody who under, there are some people who understand how difficult it is and they're around you all the time. So find people and especially find people outside of the office. I think it is important to be, you know, to have good relationships with your colleagues, of course, but having people at other agencies, it just, again, it just kind of sort of revitalizes you. It makes you feel like, you know, you're, you're part of something that's bigger than just going to the office or just doing whatever you're doing every day. You're a part of a movement. So I think that that's really important. I also think, you know, of course, self-care, I think is extremely important. I think it's just one of those words that you hear it over and over and over, and you know that it's important, but you still don't take care. Mm -hmm. But I really do think that in order for us to be sustainable in this work, we have got to take care of ourselves. We've got to, you know, take a break in the middle of the work day to go for a walk, enjoy the sunshine, take a, take a break to just watch something funny on, on YouTube, on your phone, to play a game on your, like literally just taking a moment for yourself. It's just for you in the day. We don't do that enough. So, and finding those ways to do that and making it a priority. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I would say is just, just know your worth recognize your value, understand that you are coming with so much more than just, you know, whatever education you have, you have, you have so much that you're bringing with you and know that and bring that with you whenever you're in your job, you know, don't be afraid to ask for what you need and don't, don't feel like you can't be yourself at, at work. If you're in a position where you feel like you can't be yourself, if you feel like you're in a position where you can't ask for what you need, then don't be afraid to move on. You know, understand that there, there are going to be opportunities for you in other spaces within the IPV community where you will feel safe, where you will be able to be yourself. And so find those spaces, find those people where you can express yourself and be the person that you, that you truly are and, um, you know, just don't be afraid to ask for a raise or for, you know, just speak, recognize that you have a voice here and that you have the right to use it. Um, and if you can't, then find those people around you in your community that can help lift you up. Love it. I do too. I loved that so much. Those were really beautiful words of advice, but also just really kind and thoughtful words for us to remind ourselves of in general. And Janae, I love that you brought in the know your worth mm -hmm. and own that. Um, I think that is incredibly important advice for young folks getting into the work, but really specifically uh, advocates of color to hear that. Know your worth and own it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so much. I mean, I think when you're new to a field and also when you have, when there are all these other like systemic barriers around you, you know, we're always coming in. And, and maybe even when you're not new, you always have that feeling of imposter syndrome, right? That feeling of like, am I, can I do this? Am I, am I sure I'm qualified for this? But if, if, if you were hired somewhere, you, you have the abilities, you have the skill set. And so recognize that and don't allow other people to constantly make you question that because it, it's, you're, you might. And so if you have that support around you, I think that's how you really help. That, that's how you are able to see, you know, I, I do have value and I, I'm, you probably have more value than you even know, to be honest. So, yeah. I want to lift up something that I heard both of you say, um, and I made a little note of it so that I could circle back to it. And Havana, something that you had said is you get further with support. Mm -hmm. And then Janae, I had heard you say, find your community. And so I want to I want to also use this opportunity as a way of letting other advocates of color know where to find that community. Um, and so I'm curious to hear from both of you, 
what are opportunities in the St. Louis region across Missouri to really get involved and be connected to one another and to help build in those supports to get further? Well, I will say, I mean, in the St. Louis area, we have our Advocates of Color, which is a committee of the St. Louis Ending Domestic Violence Network, Domestic and Sexual Violence Network. Um, so we, um, we try to meet regularly. We've been a little irregular because of the pandemic, but we're trying to get back into more regular meetings. So um, we have been focusing a lot in the past couple of years on self-care and all of that. So um, that's been the primary focus of that. But that, yeah, that's in the St. Louis region. Um, and I'll let Havana talk about at the MCA DSV level. Um, yeah. But I'll also say just, there are, there are opportunities to, to work with people in an informal setting, I guess. So like, you know, Havana and I have connected just because we work at the same, we work at similar agencies. And so even when we're not gathering for advocates of color, we, we still have, we, we've developed a friendship. So find your people, find people that you can um, have that, that community with and, not necessarily in a formal setting. Um, I think that's that's super important. Just, you know, do you wanna go out for coffee? I think that's, and it's hard to do sometimes, but I think just that first step and you'll, you'll be good. So. Yeah, I enjoy being part of Advocates of Color. When I was at a member agency in St. Louis, like it was, it was a time to like let down your hair and be okay. Like, yes, we talked about issues that were going on, but like, I feel like because it was not as, set up as more of a professional setting that you were able to like really relax and, and hang out and kind of talk. And that was like some self-care, like um, they did paint nights, we did happy hours, we met for lunch and it built a better relationship. So yes, it was professional and it was great to have like warm referrals um, and talk about things, but it also was like, okay, like you get me, like these are my people, <laughs> they get me. Um, and then far as like here at MOCA DSV, we have like the people of color gathering. Right now we're meeting once a month, um, but we will, we will be moving into quarterly sessions. And we do have that space where you can talk about what's going on at your agency that you can't really talk about. And I like it because it's offered for everybody that's throughout the state. So some of the things that I know that we went through working in like an urban setting, some of the rural areas are not work or not dealing with the same type of thing. It is still some of those oppressive behaviors and things in the workplace, but it looks a lot different because it's like an entire community <laughs> that you're dealing with this with because it's, it's very small. And so you have to be very strategic with how you do and say things and deal with things. I'm not saying that you can't, but it's, you know, you get to that point where you have to figure out how do I navigate this situation given my situation and so like hearing some of like the uniqueness of what folks are, are dealing with in rural areas is also kind of it kind of gives us light of what everybody is dealing with throughout the state because sometimes we can kind of get narrow-minded with what's happening in our specific area but it's, it's nice to hear like and there's some wins too like so I tried this last month like you said and this is what ends up happening you know just how everybody navigates things differently so Next year, once we move to quarterly, we will be offering opportunities for um, leadership within the group. So if there is something, a specific subject or um, level of expertise that any of the advocates have that they want to share with the group, that gives them an opportunity to be a leader. That's something that's a resume builder, and it gives them time to showcase their skill set and get feedback from other advocates because we want to build each other up, right? Like we want to be able to give them the 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 constructive criticism so that they can be better so they can do more and they can go out and build up their skill set because sometimes they have certain skill sets that they're not able to share at their agency but maybe that's something that they can share with us and we can take back to ours so that's something I'm really looking forward to with next year is being able to have those leadership opportunities and also be able to intentionally have like uh, peer mentorship so we can match uh, each other up with someone new throughout the state you can get to know somebody different and then uh, it's more of a intentional intentional moment to catch up with someone throughout the state that make those friendships make those those villages that you you may not ever have time to do it because we're still meeting virtually so like that's the easy way to do it 
Um, so I'm really looking forward to that next year because I just know how valuable it is. And I couldn't imagine working in a rural area and being the only person of color and not having anybody. And then looking forward to the POC meeting that's once a month, but then something comes up and you're unable to go like that's really tough. So, you know, that kind of gives us that time to check in on folks that we probably haven't seen or not in a while because we're paired up with them. And so we wanna check in on them and see how they're doing and what they need and how we can better support them. Well, Havana, Janae, thank you both so much for being on the episode this month. I really appreciate all of the wisdom that you shared. And I really appreciate just the two of you sharing so much of your personal experience and engaging in such a really rich discussion with me. So thank you to you both. It's it's such a pleasure. So happy to be here. So I do like to end uh, most of our episodes with kind of a random question that I throw in, trying to have it be topical to the month or whatever is going on in popular culture. Um, And coming up at the end of this month, we have Halloween. Uh, So really curious to hear from you both what is your all-time favorite halloween scary movie (laughs) so i'll give you just a minute to think about it because for me i can say that my go-to is always the original halloween Mm -hmm. there's just something so incredibly creepy and spooky about the music The score of that is just chilling and (laughs) yep, my husband and I watch it every year. I agree that that is a, that's a solid, really scary movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I probably seen that movie 10 times and I still get scared. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's scary. I think for me, (laughs) I, my go-to is the Scream franchise so me yes. and my brother we love the, the original screen movie yep. classic so good you can't tell me otherwise don't tell me anything wrong with it <laughs> um the, the subsequent one's not as good but the first one solid flick I love that movie so I would say that any anything in the screen franchise but it's definitely the original yeah, I have to agree too. As a kid, I probably would have said Beetlejuice because it was he was so creepy to me. I I love that, but I, it wasn't really scary. It was just more creepy. But I have to agree, Scream was something that like we always watched through high school. Like we got together on Halloween, and that's like what we will watch like the trilogy. Like how many can we watch before we fall asleep? And it was it it was really good. And then you start living on your own, and like closing your blinds because you're like did I just see something at my window of my door when it's dark so yeah I had to think about that for a little bit because I was like okay it was just a movie but Scream was definitely a, a favor like that can never get old I have to go with you on that one yep that is something that I will echo as well I love all of the Scream movies but that first one oh so, so good, good. Yep, so good so good <laughs> And, you know, I will give it to you, Havana. The Beetlejuice movie was very creepy as it a kid. Was. Yeah. It's, yep. still, it's still pretty creepy. I mean, the beginning is much more lighthearted. I mean, by the end, like, it's legit yeah. creepy. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm on board with you. <laughs> yep. I think we've got some uh, pretty solid movie recommendations to close out the month with then. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, once again, thank you both so much for joining me on this month's episode. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate both of you. Thank Thank you. you. All right. Thanks, y'all. Bye.